Okay, I believe things are working. I think the thing is doing the thing. And that's the important part. Yeah, it's system life. I haven't I, I don't normally do this very often, so I'm always kinda like, oh, is this working? <laughs> that's like I, I just don't know. Um so hopefully this is actually working and you all can hear me. I'm probably going to go ahead and wait a couple of minutes, like five minutes actually, just to let people kind of filter in and kind of get us sorted. But um, yeah, no, um, <laughs> I hope you're all doing well. I hope your, your convention has um, been going well. I haven't had any time to spend either yesterday or today because I've been working. I had to go at 5 a.m. this morning and to go work, and I was just like, oh, no. I, I missed, I missed um, Bean's panel on um, 3D printing and, like, prototyping protogen heads and all that stuff. So it's kind of like, oh, man. But now I'm here, and now we can actually, like, present this panel and all this kind of cool stuff because fruit shirts are cool, and the history of them are really cool. There's so much stuff that I had to leave out of this, and I really wish I didn't. But, like, we can go over the stuff, like, after the panel, if you if you want to learn more about that. Because we'll have, like, probably 15 to 20 minutes. I have a rough estimate about how long I can actually talk, so we shall see how it goes. Yeah, it's uh, 4.02 Eastern Time right now, so I'll give it another, like, two minutes, and then we can actually start. Ah, God, I am tired. I don't know about you, but this morning really killed me. Hydration. Make sure you're drinking water. I don't care if this is a virtual convention or not. You need to hydrate. It's always important. <laughs> I'm just saying. Because and I'm saying this is a person who's the one who's actually who like goes to cons and stuff. So if you've never been, do your 621, but keep doing it. Like you're never supposed to like stop that, like actually, but can you pick up or hold things in your face, Hansa? I I can certainly try. <laughs> Uh, I, my paws are not the best. I mean, they're not bad, you know, but they're, they're very stubby and not the best for actually holding things. Yeah, yes, no, no, hey, Snickers, drink water right now. Go get it. I will not start until you've gone and get water. <laughs> Please, take care of yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness. But no, yeah, I'm excited for this. I mean, I haven't presented panel a panel in way too long, honestly. So I'm actually a little nervous about this because, again, I've just... It's been a while, but... Yeah, did, did you have fur suit, fur suit? I actually don't do fursuits, funny enough. I mean, I'm actually, I made my own, funny enough, like two years ago, right before Anthrocon 2019. Um, but I don't actually, like, do this sort of thing. Yeah, you better sip, sip. Okay, um, I'll give it like 30 more seconds just so we have enough people here because it looks like we got about like, oh, 30 people in here already. So I, I think that might be enough. Water, what a concept. Egan, don't you give me that sass. <laughs> and no, soda does not work. Y'all should know by this point that soda would just dehydrate you. It makes you thirstier. That's how it works. Ugh. And no, coffee does not work. I've tried. I've been trying just to stay awake and alive this past 24 hours and it's been a, a time I don't do coffee kids <laughs> not worth it am I going to any information convention this year I will try to go to Denver as hard as I can I plan on going so hopefully I can actually make this thing maybe MFF so we'll see kombucha actually okay kombucha is good kombucha is healthy for you it has culture it is cultured and it has cultures. So yes, that is acceptable. Okay, it's 4.05. I think we're good to call it here. Let me go ahead and get myself set up. Doot doot. All right, I think we are good to go. Let me just pull up my teleprompter here. And uh, <laughs> let's get this show on the road. I got order two, don't worry. Okay, good, good. Swally Forks is healthy. No, it's not. Okay, let's get this let's get this panel started already. Hello everyone! Welcome to this history of her suiting panel. I'm Wayla, she lay, your local furry historian and bizarre hybrid coyote thing. And I used to do furries in my spare time. Like actually. 
mostly through the interviews and digging through logs and logs of conversations, but I also dip toes, my toes into modern stuff every now and then, like today. We'll mostly be going over a few fundamental ideas and periods relevant to fursuiting, kind of an overview of who's who and what's what, but also why we ended up with such a unique expression of subculture in the first place. So, without further ado, let's get fluffy. Now, I know RamCon is officially a furcon and all that, and most of you are furries, but I still think it's worth asking, what is a fursuit? Oh, audio? Is that working? Hold on. Wait a minute. Someone's saying audio. I want to make sure this is actually going. Rarely is everything, is everything okay? Is it working? Just want to make sure. Uh, uh, oh goodness, hold on. I didn't mess up, did I? Oh no, audio is fine. Okay, cool, I just want to make sure. So, okay, let me go back to the question then. What is a fursuit? I mean, it's a suit, it's got for sometimes, but not always, and uh, I don't know, it's extremely huggable? Just funny enough that just going over fursuit, over what a fursuit looks like, doesn't tell as much, ironically. So, what if we broke it down even further? Let's put it, oops, let me go, let's go this, there we go. Let's put it this way a fursuit is an iconic form of representation. What that means is that it's an easily recognizable thing that represents a distinct person or personality. That's part of the reason why I can look across an entire lobby and pick this Hokkaido Space Wolf out pretty easily. It also helps that he's red, but, you know, that's an aside. <laughs> Fursuits are also a means of, perform of performance. This could be something like dance, sure, but in all reality, it could be anything from pantomime to full-on acting. It's another part of what helps create a fursuit's iconicness, since these actions as a, as a collective tell us a lot about the suit's personality. People often choose a personality very different from their own as a way to experiment and explore different kinds of ways of being, which is, in itself, a kind of performance. That ties into our third point, which is that fursuits are a way for a person to self-express and explore their identity. It's an extremely personal form of expression for that reason, and it's no wonder that it's helped people dealing with not only things like social anxiety, but also their own concept of gender and sexual orientation. This is something that's entirely unique to fursuiting, so you won't exactly be seeing it in as much for more commercial costuming pursuits. But, okay, hang on. How did furries even get to this point in the first place? It seems like a pretty big leap to go from putting on a costume to, like, figuring your sense of self out. Turns out there is a line of logic we can follow. The key is that humans have been using animals and icons as icons and symbols for as long as we can remember. They're really handy for communicating specific ideas, whether they're more abstract, like death, or more concrete, like strength. That's why the Egyptians used animal heads on their gods. So, interesting enough, they weren't anthros in the way we think of them, but rather were used symbolically to highlight a specific trait. So it's not like they were literally animal people, but it's like, oh, this person is represented with an animal head to tell you who they are, and also what kind of traits they have, basically. Which is, kind of, which is interesting, it's not the way we usually think about that, especially in like art and such. That's part of why this usage of symbolism and iconography transfers fairly easily to places outside of the ritual, such as entertainment venues like theater, sports, or even modern amusement parks. But the mode is the same. The representations used in these cases for representing commercial interests and creations. It's also where a lot of practices that we recognize in fursuiting today come from and goes to show how recent some of these ideas are. But the real turning point was the development of fan culture in the 20th century and the subsequent convention cultures that developed within it. They were the ones looking at creations by other people and said, hey, I can make this my own thing. Whether that was crafting a costume of an already existing character or making their own, they created the idea of cosplay, costuming as a character, as something personal that took place in fan spaces. This context of fanish stuff is what we need to keep in mind as we delve into actual furries later on. So, let's start simple. Masks. Or, maybe not quite as simple as you'd think. After all, wearing them could carry pretty significant connotations, depending on the occasion. Like how I mentioned the Egyptians used animal heads to signify what traits a god has, they used animal masks to essentially stand in for a god during a certain process, like embalming a mummy. 
They're an easy way to, of changing someone's appearance, sure, but honestly, in doing so, you're almost changing who you are. The, you know, the where E, I guess you'd say. You imbue yourself with the spirit, the personality of what you're wearing. Any of you that have done theater definitely know this feeling, and honestly, nothing choreographs this quite as dramatically as kabuki, which is a kind of traditional Japanese theater. You can get away with a ton of makeup for humans and such, but if you want to portray the mischievous kitsune, someone you might not know as friend or foe, you need just the kind of right kind of mask for the occasion. The point behind this is that by using animals specifically, we're channeling a specific idea or trait. That's why in the Mexican state of Guerrero, a traditional dance sometimes involves someone not just dressed in a jaguar mask, but even fully striped clothes, and is mainly about protecting the community from this dangerous animal, just communal sense of safety and togetherness, in other words. Contrast this with a couple of indigenous peoples in the Pacific Northwest, um, mainly British Columbia. The New Chalnuth are known for being whalers for thousands of years, but also for their wolf dance a celebration that's passed down generational knowledge of one's lineage and allowed for a deeper connection to the world around them. It even came in three acts with a different type of wolf mask for each. All right, this is a fun one to pronounce. The Kwak Yaka Wok have a lot more birds, which is pretty neat, since not only is this where we see the legendary Thunderbird mentioned, but also origin stories that say their ancestors came in the form of animals of all kinds, land, sea, underground, you name it. Hence, why their potlatch dances, and yes, that's potlatch, not a potluck, that's a different thing, features quite elaborate costumes. I really need to emphasize two things for like one second. First of all, oftentimes what is considered sacred is usually accompanied by a delineation of space. What I mean is that sometimes that's a very literal thing, like a temple, church, or sacred ground, but other times, it's just the difference in action or thought that is enough to create a sense of place, you know, no matter where you are. It's the same in performance, such as theater. The theater itself demarcates that difference, but so does that suspension of disbelief you're instilled when watching the actors specifically. In other words, what you're doing with these masks is fundamentally different from everyday life. Second, the goals for which these items were used aren't really comparable to how the vast majority of furries currently use fursuits, specifically in the cases where they were used more spiritually. It wouldn't really be fair to equate an indigenous American costume and dance to, say, a modern dance competition, since the intent for each is quite different. But with that said, no matter if we're talking about Greek theater or funeral procession, it is worth noting how both, both use iconography and this idea of a different space both physical and mental, in the form of animal costumes. That's the connection we need to focus on. Boom. This is probably as good a time as any to talk about the magic and what exactly it's supposed to be, since I imagine that this is a term most of you have probably least heard of. It's a term that Disney started throwing around first back in like 50s or 60s, I believe, because officially all of their mascots are supposed to be real, quote unquote. They're the same ones you see in the cartoons and films, so if Donald Duck were to throw his head off, that would be breaking the magic that Disney had set up at its theme parks. In other words, we still see that delineation of space today, though in this case for the purposes of entertainment. It's no wonder that this attitude was carried over into the first furry conventions in the 1990s, since the con space acted in a similar fashion. It was used for similar reasons. Not everyone agrees on whether this rule should be respected, and it is certainly a point of contention depending on who you ask. But regardless, it's a remnant of how we use costumes in the past as both a personal and communal way of creating a different sense of space. Even though on some level we know that these costumes and masks aren't real, we're willing to believe it. Alright, now we've established most of our ground rules, so let's get to the bottom of things and find actual fur suits. Now, where in the heck are you gonna find, uh... Right, yeah, yeah <laughs> that'll do. Yeah, you could thank the British for this one, since they're the originals, originators of pantomime theater. Uh, theater, technically, yes. It's more than just speechless performance, you know. After all, pantomime literally means a dancer who acts all the rules, in reference to a Roman pantomime, a type of one-man actor who uses masks and gesture to act out a whole story. I didn't write this part down, but it's kind of worth wrenching that, like, 
you'd have this singular actor like moving around all crazy with like putting on different masks and then he was person off to the side he was like hey i'm the singer let me tell you about what the hell is going on here you know that was kind of how it works so that's where the term pantomime was like originated it's kind of cool but those classical influences came into english folk plays through italian theater where you might recognize characters like the harlequin aka the maximum sass build of the victorian era i mean just look at this man and tell me his charisma isn't like 30 or something like oh my god wow <laughs> what that means for us though is that the actual stories in these plays can be literally anything greek comedy fairy tales like jack and the beanstalk popular novels like robinson crusoe you name it they're fun. They're like fun, you know, for kids sort of performances that adults could actually enjoy as well, though definitely were considered serious theater, quote unquote. But they're also interactive. The actors are right there in front of you. So just like original Shakespeare, where Prince Hamlet is asking the audience what he should do, these actors would have audience members singing along and talking back to the characters. The ones that got a lot of attention were, of course, the pantomime animal skins. It made sense that the costumes they wore were called animal skins, or just skins, because they were made of actual animal fur. Synthetic fur wouldn't be a practical material until like the 1950s, so this is what you had to work with. So here we come to Charles Lorry, arguably one of the most famous of the Victorian pantomime animal actors. He not only played just about any animal convincingly, he designed and made each skin he wore. Seriously, this particular one of a poodle was one of two for the same play. The year he was performing this, he said, I need hardly say that I am an entire believer in studying from life. When getting my poodle part, I had had one always with me at home, and it was from him that I learnt nearly all my tricks. <laughs> oh my goodness. He studied the material and he knew it to a T. Kind of like how some fursuiters today will study the animal they're playing to better portray their character. It could be calls, it could be how they move around, how they act with people, that kind of thing. Is this what we would call a proto-fursuiter? Mm, perhaps. But we could go further. <laughs> the original poodling. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. You might have already noticed this, but... Pantomime is exactly that popular anymore as, like, entertainment for the masses. Why is that? Probably because something even more accessible came about right at the turn of the 20th century. Film! A lot of the traditions of pantomime, vaudeville, burlesque, and other, like, street theater performances would pass on into cinema, including the use of animal skins. Most of you have seen the 1939 film of The Wizard of Oz, yeah? I imagine so. You know the Cowardly Lion? That's a skin, like an actual animal skin, like a lion skin, just like we've seen in pantomime. Only this time, vaudeville actor Bert Lahr would be donning a rubber mask, since the proximity of the camera allowed us to pick up on the subtleties of facial expressions. You know, compared to like being 50 feet back in the stage, from the stage and like way up in the, in the stands and stuff. This is where you can tell the differences between the people who saw film as an extension of pantomime and those who recognize how fundamentally different it could be used. This is especially for filmmakers dipping their toes into relatively new genres, at least new in the grand scheme of things. Science fiction had existed since Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein back in like 1818, but pulp fiction, like those pulp magazines and like cheaply made like um, shorts and that kind of stuff that you just buy at newsstands, really boosted its popularity during the first half of the 20th century. Same goes for horror, since both were popular topics at the time, and you could see the sheer influence of these genres in films of the period. I'm not just talking about all the Universal Studios films like The Wolfman and, you know, Clichy from Black Lagoon either, but also kaiju films like Godzilla. You cannot convince me that a man in a giant rubber suit walking around a miniature city is nothing less than hilarious. <laughs> And I can guarantee you, like, like low-key, this is like 200% where the macro-micro thing comes from. Besides films like Attack of the 50 Volt Woman and The Incredible Shrinking Man. But the main takeaway is that film, through the budgets it allowed and the intimacy the camera gave compared to sitting rows of seats away from a stage, allowed for these techniques to flourish and innovate quite rapidly. That's why Planet of the Apes was regarded so highly, because its costume and makeup game was beyond top tier. 
They spent a huge chunk of their budget on just the facial makeup for the, all these actors, and this would only be the tip of the iceberg as far as films with crazy special effects go. I mean, it only get crazier once you throw in, like, animatronics, CGI, all this other stuff. But, like, that's, like, modern stuff, you know? So, that's our background as a whole. And yes, I just called everything I talked about background knowledge, because we're about to get into the real meat of things. Professional mascot costumes. The norms that we have regarding fursuits, the way we interact with them and treat them, lay squarely with two groups, Disney and cosplay. Let's talk about Disney first, because, like, you can never really get away from the house of mouse, can you? <laughs> How in the world did an animation studio come to change costuming? One word, Disneyland. Part of the design behind Disney's theme parks, like the intent that he had in mind when he was like drafting this stuff up, was getting to meet the actual characters he designed and portrayed and his cartoons. You know, something a little more exciting than visiting a movie studio, even though like, honestly, it's pretty cool. I mean, I don't get to do that very often. While it was easy to show off the human characters by just putting them in costume, the road to getting a good animal costume was, uh, oh, here. Did it work? Ah, there we go. Not ideal. Like, not even close. It wasn't just rushed. It was like supreme procrastination. They looked absolutely awful. And at first, we're not even allowed to... See, they were actually allowed to speak. Like, that was just a thing they would do. But after a number of mishaps regarding, like, poor voice acting work, they banned all fur characters, as these cartoon characters were known, from speaking at all. That just became the norm. While they were certainly used, they certainly used it before, now they relied entirely on the visual language of pantomime theater to communicate and interact with park guests. You also see this same sort of acting with sports mascots, though that had more to do with the fact that you're standing up in the stands while they're running around in the field. But the costumes got better, let's be fair, and so did the acting as a result. You know, it just adds time and effort, you know, repetition and just kind of like iteration as that goes on. That's really kind of what it amounts to. Something that's honestly quite interesting is that, at least in part, the actors of these characters had to make and maintain their own costumes. They'd usually sculpt the head out of clay, make a mold, and then fiberglass it. This is honestly what we would call a prototypical fursuit head, since it was made with techniques that we still see in use today in cosplay, like, all the time. But more importantly, it's the intent of the costume that's different from what we've seen before. We're portraying a specific character with a distinct personality, and we designed the costume around those traits. In the case of Disney, these were commercial characters that were more or less set in stone, so there wasn't much exactly else going on there. But when fans started digging into these sorts of ideas, they take things in a very different direction. Let me check comments here, make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, da, da, da. Yes, uh, oh, yep, everyone's like, yeah, nightmare fuel, yep. Oh, why? Why indeed, yeah, we're, we're still wondering about that. Um, oh, right, I haven't really talked much about this yet, but like, this is worth highlighting if it wasn't already obvious. I wasn't really good at this sort of thing. You don't have to worry about like the uncanny valley or any of the weirdness that happens when you try to replicate a specific person. It's just the character, and any imperfections are easier to gloss over because we're not looking for them like we do in humans. We're not looking for the same sorts of details. So, when did the nerds come in? Well, right now, you nerds. <laughs> I talked about this at length in my other panels, but fan culture is a relatively new thing, all things considered. You can trace it back to the 1920s with letter columns in science fiction magazines turning into organized clubs, and then full-scale conventions by like the 40s. With it came a group of fans who focused primarily on costume making. First, of, first off, just like titular SF heroes and superheroes, but as these horror and B-movie science fiction films started coming out in waves, so did the fan reproductions of these costumes. I cannot overstate how important the influence of film, but also serial television was on fan culture, because it changed the dominant type of fan from a reader of Pulp Fiction and SF novels to a viewer of The Twilight Zone, Man From U.N.C.L.E., and Star Trek. You know what that means, though, right? It means the influences on fans become a lot more visual, and so that visualness was reflected in what fans made. You know, less writing stuff and like fan fiction to more like fan art, for example. I'm sure I don't have to say this to all of you, but remember this. What fans make isn't just blind devotion to what they like. It's a kind of communication, a back and forth with the source material. 
We take our own interpretations and share it with each other communally. And the way we share with each other that communal passion that we have is what truly defines fan culture. So as fans define their own spaces and cons and created their own costumes for these spaces, they also started treating them like actual characters too. It became an expectation, a norm, something that just is. Hence, cosplay, a field as diverse as you can imagine. Never underestimate the potential of fans because when you give passion to artists an outlet, they will create so many things. So many things. <laughs> Something that Mark Berlino, one of the guys who helped get furry fandom off the ground, noticed when he went to Star Trek conventions like in the 70s, when it was like relatively new, was how much better the fan costumes could be. Well, I think we can all agree that the quality of co the fan costumes can range from like, terrible to freaking unbelievable. There's no comparing even movie-grade prosthetics to the 10-foot-tall mechs you see walking around some dealer's rooms. Also, it's right in front of you, so you can actually, like, interact and take photos of them, and it's, like, it's, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> Definitely would recommend it. Like, again, if you haven't been to cons, you're missing out. Boom, boom, here we are. Finally, we get to actual furries. If you want all the details on furry history, feel free to check out my actual furry history panel, because there's a lot of details we could go over, but it's, like, not necessarily relevant to, like, costuming and all that stuff, so here's the Cliff Notes version. We primarily stem from a marriage, holy or unholy, of underground and independent comics and anime fans that happened around 1980, to put it simply. Since, only the, since the only conventions you could go to in the 80s were comic cons or science fiction conventions, those were just the two, a healthy dose of both of these kinds of fans, SF and comics, found their way into these early gatherings as well. They're just there in sheer numbers. So the first furry parties, as they were known, didn't become a thing until about, like, 1986. And the first conventions didn't happen until about 1989. But all of this was happening within the trappings of larger fan culture, which got a lot of its influences from material that other people made. Furry started, so furry certainly started that way. Especially when, it, especially when it came to, like, American animation from, like, Disney, Warner Brothers, Hanna-Barbera, you know, stuff like that. But because you had fans coming from so many different fields, I'm talking like anime, science fiction, fantasy, horror, comics, the list goes on, there was no singular canon. There couldn't be, because the focus wasn't on this or that television series. It was about an idea, an aesthetic, that everyone found cool and appealing. It really shouldn't surprise anyone that furries took the fanish mindset of I can make my own thing and turn it into I can make my own stories and characters. That? That is a huge difference between everyone else and us. Because you're shifting the focus from without to within. Oop. Hence how we ended up with anthologies like Albedo right around 1984-ish, which was one of the first publications that was truly furry in origin, like, in its entirety. And it was, like, with multiple artists, too. So, that's pretty cool, honestly. But how does costuming tie into this? Allow me to introduce you to Robert Hill, the grandfather of all fursuit makers. He had been performing at Disney as their fur character since the 70s, and was also an avid reader of manga for just as long, and that's, like, before anime fandom was, like, really ever a thing. Because, like, the first anime, like, club was in, made in, like, 1977, for reference. So, like, he's, like, an OG in terms of, like, people who were into this stuff. As I mentioned before, Disney performers had to make and maintain their own costumes. So, after he left the company, he took his knowledge and applied it to this fandom he didn't even know could exist. They just found so interesting. And so, this was his first stone. Annabelle. Made in 1987. Isn't she cute? It's very, just literally just a giant fluffy teddy bear. It's kind of awesome. Um, in other words, though, what you're looking at is the very first fursuit as we know it. Like this right here. You can definitely see how the Disney influences are in the, uh, incorporated into the design, such as the head shape and the eyes. But you'll also notice how it's a character donned in an actual form-fitting suit of fur, not clothes or a baggy one-size-fits-all bodysuit you'd see in theme parks or sports stadiums. After all, this wasn't made for multiple people. It was made for him, specifically. 
It was personal, and thus we finally come to user-customized, wearable art. At least outside the professional sphere, because like our pool of acts were from before. It's not like people didn't make like one-off you know, things before for just one person, but this is the first time we're seeing it beyond something that's like for a profession, for like a job or like, you know, something like that. Probably the suit that honestly most people saw walking around cons and considered the first was actually Hilda the Bambioid, which, is, which she was made in 1988. Bob was a fan of Jerry Collins' anthro deer species called Bambioids, mostly known for being you know, sexy, wear, leather-wearing space warriors, basically, in all the comics that he made. Um, Bob was a good friend of Jerry's, so he made his own Bambioid character that emulated the more anime-inspired art style of the species and the comics. So, right away, notice the difference in head shape and the eyes, for example. Anime and furry are basically cousins, as far as fandoms go, since... The founders of both are literally the same people. So it's no wonder to see its influence in costuming. And, of course, the character is designed to be much, honestly, much sexier to the stereotypical Disney example like we just saw. Right away, we can see how furries are more willing to address more adult topics. Not necessarily explicit, but just more like adult, since they're not limited by corporate expectations. They're able to express different, more bombastic characters more freely, and this is definitely a hallmark of furry acting compared even to the rowdiest of sports mascots. But that pantomime tradition, which we've seen, of playing up a character's personality to the max is still very much there. So, Hilda the Bamboid was a big hit, but with one maker came another, and honestly, Bob Hall and Sean Keller were pretty much contemporaries as far as who started the fursuit trend. Sean was an animator for Disney by the time he started making suits in the early 90s, but he was also a huge Warner Brothers fan. Like, he was a big collector. So just looking at most of his suits, you can absolutely see the influence of both. And also, can we... Real talk, <laughs> Real talk can we take a moment to appreciate this bird... Like, I don't know what it is, but it's just like, it's just the aesthetic of it, and just the shape, the carving on it, it's just so good. It's from like the early 90s, like when this is just taking off, like seriously, and it's just, I could see this today and still be like, wow, that is cool, you know? That's like how well it holds up. And speaking of which, carving techniques using foam really get a step up starting in the early 90s, allowing for more unique head shapes and even body shapes which you can see especially in the works of Lance Ikegawa, who's also a contemporary of the other two. His suits opt for a bit more realism, as you can see from here. I mean, look at this. This is incredible, especially when comparing the baggy body designs of previous suits. This was made possible by making a duct tape dummy, which, where you wrap a person in tape and then layer foam on top of that mummy you've made for more digitigrade looking legs, for example. Like, that, this basically, that basically became a thing with these kinds of suits because that's what you had to do to get it to fit you and also get the shapes that you wanted. You know, they were just, they were innovating as they went oftentimes and using techniques either from theater or like literally making it as they go, you know. So it's really cool to kind of see how they kind of started their own trends in that way. That and the use of high quality synthetic furs really make a difference when constructing full body costumes. Like, a huge, huge difference. Also, real quick for the materials nerds out there, let me just, let's just mention how much faux fur advanced since the 50s. I'm not going to dive into, like, the actual manufacturing processes as, as much as I'd love to, but originally, when they made faux fur, it was limited in... It was very limited, honestly, in colors and wasn't very good-looking, since mainly because the polymers they were using weren't all that great. They just weren't great at quality. Like, before they were even using that, they were trying to use alpaca fur to just, like, replicate it. And it just was not all that good. But it was when they started using acrylics, specifically, that things took off because they were easy to color. E way easier to color, for that matter. Weren't nearly as heavy as um, previous materials. And they could also be made much more dense. So that way it doesn't look kind of, like, less kind of patchy looking. It's much more, like, soft and kind of more like supple in texture. About a decade after that, this would have been like the 60s, I want to say, they realized they could take it a step further to improve texture and even make the fur fire resistant. It started using what are called modacrylics. This is the main polymer used in faux fur today, and it's usually referred to as pile fabrics. The fursuit makers among you have probably heard the term pile thrown around, especially when you're shopping 
online for that one specific color you can't seem to find. But having that diversity color would not have been possible without innovations like this. So why did Faux Fur start blowing up and giving us a bunch of options as far as colors go? One word. Fashion. <laughs> Using real animal fur isn't exactly a vulgar garden anymore, mainly in the name of animal rights. So there's been a big push to find alternatives that look and feel like real fur. The color part comes from team fashion specifically, since Abercrombie and Fitch, American Eagle, and even like ASOS use it as, as a decent amount in things like hats and sweaters, stuff like that, among other things. But honestly, it's gotten to the point where furries are starting to honestly like have enough demand that we can special order colors from manufacturers directly. Finally, I can get that off green neon yellow I've always wanted for my rave sauna. <laughs> I tried to read that without laughing, and I... No, I, it's not possible. Uh, this is the timeline we're living in, friends. <laughs> it's a good one, though. Also, here's an interesting bit of trivia. What did Freeze call for suits before the term existed? Well, if you went to Conference Zero back in 1989, that being the very first fur con, it was like the prototype con. It was literally labeled as that. Um, the only phrase you'd see thrown around would be furry costuming aka those cool costumes Robert Hill and Sean Keller were making. But fursuit does not have the origin you'd expect. In fact, Robert King was the guy who in 1993 created fursuit, the furry costume information exchange, which was a mailing list for information on costuming technology and performance. Basically how people could share their knowledge about what their techniques are, what they can do better for, to make their own costumes, and really just kind of share the knowledge so more people can kind of do it on their own. Notice the pronunciation, for suit. It's a pun on pursuit. Like you're seeking out something because you're seeking out information on fur things. <laughs> it's like, of course, when people picked up on was the fact that it looks like fur suit. So it became the new default term for these types of costumes specifically. Ah, da da da. Ah, da da da. Oh, there we go. I had to pick up my script here. By the way, okay, so that was kind of a tangent. To get back to fursuits in general, something that you would not, you won't nearly see nearly as much today, but was super common in the 90s fur cons, was the use of prosthetic masks, like you'd see in film. This was mainly because, honestly, understandably, most people didn't have much experience making full body costumes. That was a learned skill, which people like Sean and Bob would share and pass down to the next generation of makers, but that took the better part of a decade to happen. In the meantime, masks and makeup were more readily available and more widely understood by fan artists since, excuse me, they've been doing it forever, for this kind of sort of thing in science fiction and comics conventions forever, since they've been basically replicating the movies, and honestly, they could be just as good as some fursuits. It's honestly a shame that we don't see this as much anymore, but that just goes to show how much more accessible the knowledge of fursuit making has become in the past 20 years alone. Speaking of which, oh god, where do I even start with the past 20 years of fursuit making? There's so much. And again, I had to leave so much out, but I, I at least wanted bullet points, something I could at least kind of show off. It, it's literally exploded in terms of how many people are involved and how advanced it's getting. To just glimpse at the tech being used now, you're seeing more animatronics for things like controllable tails, ears, eyes, and mouths, making the suit feel that much more alive. You're seeing people use silicone molds to make resin bases for fursuit heads, allowing for more exact and detailed head designs than foam carving. And honestly, it's kind of superior than using the old um, fiberglass method, for that matter. It's a little kind of easier to get into. Um, and more recently, you're seeing the use of 3D printing to develop even more precise shapes that would be extremely difficult to produce by hand. My friend Bean just presented today on his techniques for making his protogen head base, so definitely watch the recording of his stream on Twitch if you haven't already, because the details on this process are awesome. Also, you should, like, totally download his protogen head on Thingverse. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> okay. So, in terms of how many people make suits nowadays, my friend Ezo, the space wolf I mentioned before, has compiled a list of every active maker he can find. Like, what, regardless of how active they are, if it's like, oh, they actively sell suits, or it's like, no, I just make them for my own kind of uses, or that kind of thing. And so far, 
he's counted 168 individual makers and companies. That's insane. Even when you think about how this includes people from all over the world, it's far more than the dozen or so makers that we'd see more, os more often, such as, I don't know, Houndsteeth, Alpha Dogs, Multicolor Bark, Made For You, One For All, Joe Costumes, Fursuits by Lacey, Mixed Candy. There are so many makers. They're so good. And that's a beautiful thing. There's so many unique and individual expressions of style, species, and personalities that it creates this quite literal rainbow quilt of fur. And this brings me to my final point of fursuits and how this culmination of historical facts and ideas have brought about a singular poignant idea, individual expression. This is honestly the most important part about fursuiting, at least to me, but I know I'm not the only one that shares this belief. When you don the head, your own personal mask falls off. You're transported in a way that's fundamentally different from an actor putting on a facade. You're more, you become more you. Not always you as in your current personality, but the ideas, the emotions, and hopes that well up inside you, manif that, and they manifest into this costume. Physically in terms of how it's designed, but also emotionally in terms of how you feel you can act, or speak, or interact with others in ways that you would otherwise never do. It's a, it is an extension of the self. I remember seeing a tweet two days ago, this one specifically, from Joe Costumes about a refurbished head they just finished. One of their clients had transitioned, so they asked Jill to help their suit transition too. This isn't someone acting. This is someone who, through the things they wore, be became more themselves. And that, honestly, that is something worth celebrating. That's what kind of makes our community in particular so special. That's the end of the panel. Thank you all very much for attending. This has been a fun project to work on, and I learned a lot through my own studies about both recent furry history and on what came before. If any of you have questions for me, now is the time to ask. We'll have the next, oh, 15 to 20 minutes or so just to talk and do a bit of Q&A, but whatever you feel like talking about, so let me know. This has been fun. I appreciate you all for being here. Now I can actually take a swig of water because I need to hydrate. Public speaking, drink some lemon juice, have some hot toddy. I don't know, do something to help clear out your sinuses, but also make sure to definitely drink water when you talk for like 40 minutes at a time. Oh my goodness. Oh, thanks everyone. <laughs> no, this, this has been fun, honestly. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, like that last bit really like is a is a tearjerker for me because it is a very personal thing, honestly. So like I don't know, it's I I, I thought it was something that does definitely at least worth mentioning because like oh this is perfect. I I have to include this. Who is your favorite suit maker as of right now? Okay, let me go ahead and pull up. My favorite maker. Hold on. Let me pull this up just for you guys. Just for y'all. All right. It would honestly have to be Jill Costumes. Certainly not the most famous of the makers out there, but I just love their style. It's something that I just absolutely adore in terms of how the faces are made, how they style the eyes, just the airbrushing around the muzzle and all this kind of stuff, the way they're able to cut the fur. It's just, it, it works really well. You know, it's the sort of thing that I just, it's kind of like one of my dream makers I go to. Do you have a Sona? And if so, what's their species? Oh, actually, here, let me go ahead and pull this up really quick because I can just go to Affinity and pull up, yes, this one. Here we go. This is the gal. Oh, let me make sure. Yeah, okay, so it is working. I'm sure that it's actually capturing that window. Yeah, this is Wayla. She's a coyote dragon, and she is a bit of a mess, but honestly, this is the first one I've actually designed on my own, funny enough. Like, uh, all the ones before were actually, my friends helped me come up with, like, 
the markings and the colors and that stuff, but like this one was first originally me, like back in like beginning of 2019 as I was starting my own transition. So like she's kind of dear to me in that way. So I don't know. I think she's cool. Um, what do you think fur suits will turn like in the future? I think they'll employ um, heavier use of 3D printing for not just realism, but also cartoony faces. That way it'll be a little easier to get more exact and more more of the shape that you want because carving by hand foam is a skill like really a skill and i know that for some people doing 3d modeling is actually easier because it's a little more precise it's not quite as kind of like guessworky at least especially when you're first starting out so i have a feeling that's going to be way more the case in the in the future that and just kind of like more cool for um uh, what's the word interactivity i guess like maybe blinking eyes movable like um, animatronic mouths, like, how do they want to do it? Materials will also will probably be changed too. I think that'd be kind of cool. Uh, da, da, da. Hey, I'm glad you like her, actually. Yeah, actually cool. What is the best type of suit for you as in full suit part? Oh! Oh, God, do I... Don't make me pick. Oh, God, I don't, I don't want to pick. <laughs> Honestly, I would say partial, mainly because it makes clothes wearing a little easier. Um, it's the sort of thing that I find a little more customizable for that reason. So, like, if I wanted to get a suit, I would do a partial because then I could wear like the kind of leather jacket that I want. I wouldn't have to get one custom made that's like oversized. You know what I mean? That way, I could kind of reuse stuff. That's more my thing. I know some people prefer the full suit experience. I just know that like, either way, you're gonna be overheating. <laughs> Um, any tips on public speaking? I find you an amazing speaker and presenter, honestly, and really like the flow of the presentation and all. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. A lot of that came, comes from the fact that I was on the speech team when I was in high school. So I had a lot of practice on gaining confidence when talking to people. And a lot of that is really coming down to not only practice, this is why they always say talk to walls or like those, those speech people are talking to the walls again because that's what we do. We, we practice the speech over and over just to practice enunciation and pacing and all this kind of stuff that's like really fundamental to like presenting an um, a explanatory piece or an informational piece or um, ones you're trying to convince people, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but also it's a mindset thing. You have to kind of relax a little bit don't get too trapped, uh, caught up on the mistakes that you made. Because, like, I tripped up a little bit when I was speaking, right? But I just kept going. You know, I don't, I don't focus on it. Because if I focus on it, then you're focusing on it. So that's kind of an important thing to do when you're speaking. So really, it's practice. And also, I don't just relax a little bit. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yes, I would prefer fist if I physically hand it. So, yeah, three-quarter, definitely. I could do the legs. I could even get, like, custom shoes and stuff. But, like... Either half or three quarter would probably be what I would do. At least get the feet. Is this stream gonna stay on YouTube? Wanna get a proper rewatch? Yes, no, this this will stay on YouTube. Um, Twitch streams tend to expire unless you take the original recording and post it, or if you record the Twitch stream and then post that onto a site like YouTube. So yeah, this will stay up here. Like, all my previous panels have stayed on, so this one will also stay. What are your pronouns? Um, I go by she, they. That's kind of, I mean, I could do either or. It doesn't really matter. I, I, it, it, I get, people throw in a lot of terms. Like, I guess demigirl is kind of the technical term, but I just go, like, oh, I don't know, some kind of tomboy thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really worry too much about it. It just is what it is. You were saying at the start you didn't fit everything in, anything you was particularly interesting and wanted to add. Honestly, more about movie costumes and more about fan costumes because there is so much that I could go over. Oh, also, more on like talking about like how like the style of fursuits has evolved over the years. Like the past 30 years is basically what it's been because like ever since um, Bob Hall stuff and Sean Keller and Ikigara stuff and... Like, those big three. Those were the big three in the beginning. But, like, others came after them because then you have a bunch of food suit food suiters became prominent in the 2000s and then in the 2010s, and they're kind of like these different, like, generations almost. And I would be interested in, like, 
studying this and seeing like, okay, what are the stylistic influences going on with each generation? And, and like, why is this going on? What are they doing different? They're probably influenced by like current animation that's going on. Like, I don't know, maybe one was influenced by Gravity Falls or something like that. I don't know. But that would be cool. I would like that personally. That would be really interesting. What was or is the worst type of fursuit? Um, probably um, Uncle Kage wearing a paper bag on his head. <laughs> I don't know. Let me see if I can find this. Avokage paper bag fursuit. I, there's a photo. Here it is. Okay. Yes, it's the unknown furry. <laughs> this is probably, literally, sign around his neck, going to like Miff and Furby back in like 2001 and stuff. Just paper bag, go paper cone, little fuzzies coming out of the nose. This. This is, this is it. This is the worst one. <laughs> Which also makes it the best one, but you know. <laughs> it's not that I filled you with advice questions, yeah, but any tips to make a persona? I really find it hard to represent myself through a form of an animal on two legs. Um, try not to focus super hard on lots of details. Think more about the species first, whether that's one or a hybrid, and kind of think about their personality and kind of like whether you want them to kind of feel more cuddly or more scary or intimidating or kind of more chill, cool. I mean, it, like, figure out those fundamental parts about who they are, and then you can start coming up with, like, what colors would go well. Like, finding, like, um, cool tone colors as opposed to warm tone colors, depending on whether they want to be more, like, chill or kind of, like, sad character versus more, like, bubbly or cheerful character. You know, that's, like, that's things to think about. They're kind of, like, design things. But they're not, like, requirements for a good Sona, you know? Again, it's really kind of just, like, figuring out that core character is kind of where I'd say, ooh, yeah, I'd love to see you do a presentation on that. I would love to do a presentation on that. And maybe next RamCon, I will. <laughs> I mean, like, ideas, and I, hopefully I won't, like, wait too long to do that, because that would be a lot of fun to do. Um, it reminds me of my sleep paralysis statement. Best of the worst. Yep. Definitely best of the worst. Uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, any other questions? We have about like probably eight more minutes. So, I mean, if you don't, if I had any more, I mean, honestly, I'm fine with that. But I was happy to be able to answer as much as I could. Because there is, there is honestly just a lot of stuff that I just did not have time to bring up, honestly, and I wish I could. Whew. Man. I'm glad you liked it, though, honestly. I thought it was a good panel. I was kind of, like I said, I was kind of nervous going into this, being like, oh, I haven't done this in a while, I don't know, but no, no, I, th I had fun. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> what more Brooklyn can we get? What was it like to research all of this? It was honestly interesting, mainly because... Oh, geez, I need to stretch out of my leg real quick. I'm falling asleep. Um, mainly because, for me, I'm, I'm a historian by trade. I actually went to school and got my degree in history and classical studies. So, like, the research part is something I'm very familiar with, like the actual process. But um, it was the sources of all the stuff that I certainly didn't expect. Like, for example, going into pantomime theater, I didn't know much about it going in honestly. And I didn't realize that, oh wait, pantomime isn't just like people aren't talking. In fact, it, original pantomime theater, people were talking like all the time. Um, it's just that the mimes of the pantomime were the stock characters who just did not talk because those very much existed. They weren't to be very exaggerated. You can tell their personality just from how they move and how they talk or they, they, they like walk at people, you know, very like Jojo-esque sort of, sort of things, you know. But like, that's the thing. It was, like, that's the influence and that's kind of what's affected us into the modern day. And that's really cool to kind of see its influences everywhere, but especially, like, within our own community. Especially with, like, how people, like, act at cons, you know, very over-the-top oftentimes. What's your favorite weird from the Sona species? Um, ooh. Ooh, goodness. God, I, I have to think about that. Because, like, weird as in, like, I've seen a manatee one before. That was cool. Because usually you don't see, like, a lot of sea creatures very often. But, um... No, that I, I'd, I would say probably something like that. More like a maritime, kind of like... 
whale-ish sort of thing. Like, oh, especially orca whales. Those are cool. Um, like uh, orcas or killer killer whales. Yeah, no, I would say that'd be my favorite kind of weirder something more. I would say weird. I'd say more uncommon. That'd be the term I use. Uh, yeah, I'd say Wolverine's count mainly because you just don't see him a lot. Coolie. Oh well. Where did you find the earliest references, e.g. 19th century England? Where did I find them in terms of, like, where? Um, yeah, no, it is really cute. But, like, as far as, like, where I found it, um, historical archives, more often than not, um, I don't know, do I still have that page up? Oh, goodness. But essentially, there are historical societies that study just theater. And there's this one article that this one place wrote about where I found that... Um, pamphlet for Robinson Crusoe and it was really cool to find that because that was essentially what the whole article was about was just pantomime you know and it also included that stuff on uh, the political actor which is really cool so that's that's where I tend to look for those kinds of things I love when I need to figure out how do we do a horned lizard horned lizards are cool that'd be like a really cool resin base suit honestly because then you can really get all those little details in like the scales and all that kind of thing at least I would say so. Cool, yo. All right, well, I will go ahead and call it here because I think we are just about done. Thanks again for you all for being here. This was honestly a pleasure to do. And I hope to do this at uh, panels in the future because, again, I just like doing this kind of stuff. And I hope like, if you say you want me to do that one on like trends and design, I would totally do that. So. Here's to that, and here's to all you. Thanks again for being here, y'all, and I will talk to you later. Enjoy the rest of your con.